Hi, this is the Empower Together podcast. I am Desiree Parker, your host, and today I have with me Wendy Olson. Um, I'm so excited to have her here. Wendy is a healing coach, founder, and executive director of Grit Plus Gumption Farmstead, which I love that name. Um, Wendy believes in the power of story to change and shape people's lives. She walks with women through their stories of past hurts and traumas and guides them to find their own freedom and healing. Um, through Grit Plus Gumption, she serves survivors of sexual exploitation and domestic violence. Um, having applied all she teaches to her own life as a survivor herself, she is able to guide women with kindness and grace, uh, showing them there is always more freedom to be had in one's life. Um, Wendy believes that everyone has a story, and even if the story is really hard up to this point, it doesn't mean the rest of her story has to be. And I love that. Um, so welcome, Wendy. Um, I love seeing you. you. Wendy and I have known each other for a long time. Um, so yeah, just so happy to have you here. How are Thank you? Thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm so excited. I just, I love yeah. talking to you. We could talk for hours. I know. I know. Before we recorded, we talked forever. So, <laughs> just like catching up. Um, I always love having people on here that we can, like, I can catch up with and that, um, you know, we can talk and, and just chat forever. Like, um, this is really for us, right? It's just other people. I listen. know. <laughs> other people get to listen to, like, me catching up with my friends, which I absolutely love. Um, so tell people a little bit about Grit and Gumption, uh, Grit Plus Gumption Farmstead. Um, I just, like I said, I love that name. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we serve, like you said, women survivors of uh, sexual exploitation and domestic violence. We provide free therapeutic services and we host quarterly healing retreats um, for these survivors. So they'll actually go on four retreats in a year, one per season, fall, winter, spring, summer. Um, we do a 12 week story workshop, which is narrative focused trauma care before we lead into the healing retreats. Um, we are a grassroots nonprofit, which is just another word for really small. And um, <laughs> we, we, uh, intentionally stay small in our communities because th we believe that uh, long lasting sustainable healing happens in smaller communities. So right now we serve five clients and we are maxed out there for the year until we're done with, we have one more retreat coming up for two of our domestic violence clients. And then, um, then we'll, we'll add in two more clients, but we intentionally keep it small. We uh, work on a ratio of one to one, even on retreats. So, so yeah, staying small on purpose. Which I think is great um, because healing happens in relationship. Um, and the more people you have involved, um, the harder it is to maintain that relationship. Yes. Um, and it becomes more of a, you know, almost classroom style. Um, and, and it's really hard to build a relationship if it's one on you know, five or six, um, people don't get the one-on-one -on -one attention that they need to, um, you know, really form, um, a good connection. So yeah, I love that you do that. I mean, that's how, same as you said, it happens in relationship, it happens in community, just the small tight knit, you know, community of mm -hmm. like the whole reason that we invite people into this space is people, need like that extra layer of healing. Right. So I always mm -hmm. like to say like, there's kind of this pipeline of how things work in anti-trafficking space. It's like, you know, like safe house and then program and then graduation and then good luck, you know? Um, <laughs> yes. So like yes. after that, you know, and that works, works great. But after that, we're like that fifth, sixth step. So like a year yeah. or maybe two years later, whenever they're feeling like, man, is this all there is? Like just going to work, having a job, raising some kids. Um, but they still feel just like that, that tenuous relationship with inside their body. It's just, it's something is still not sitting right. Um, yeah. And that's where we hope to come in and, and meet them there. And we yeah. want everyone to feel seen, known, loved and heard. So, I yeah. Love that. And you mentioned that, that, you know, that pipeline, because I've been part of that pipeline. I mean, I've worked in residential uh, care and I've worked in safe houses and, um, and at one point over transitional living, you know, um, uh, house as well. And, um, and it works for some, but it doesn't really, it, it doesn't work for everybody. Um, right. and so I love that there's this piece that, um, is intentional for after that, that intensive piece, 
um, of healing where people have gone through their, their counseling and they may have gone through a program or they may have gone through something different. Um, whatever style of, of intensive healing that they've done. Now this is for, um, connective, um, you know, at relational, um, really moving forward. Um, it's not backward focused. Um, it's helping them become forward focused. Yeah. I mean, I, we do go through, you know, stories of our past. We go through four different sure. stories of past harms, but, um, I, because in order to move forward, you have to go back right for this, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, by the end, it's always our goal for like empowerment and like, like all of this, which it feels counterintuitive. And I even had a client talk about this uh, when we were on retreat a few weeks ago. She was like, you know, when we first started, I was like, damn it, Wendy, why do I got to go through this part? You know, to, like, fine, I'll do your stories, like whatever. But And then she's like, but you were right. And I hate to admit that. <laughs> like, yeah. This is, I mean, I, I know I went through story work myself. I still do it as mm -hmm. a healing modality for, um, life as it just happens. And, and, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's really hard digging through those stories. I always say like, we're kicking up a lot of dust, right? Like try not to joke mm -hmm. on it. <laughs> um, yes. but also like we want to like push, but not like over the edge either. It's not like this yeah. crazy extreme. It's, it's like, we're just nudging like, hmm, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought yes. about this? There was a, a meme going around on Facebook, uh, that was like, describe your your job in like the worst way possible or just like in the, in the simplest of terms and it was like people I listen to people's stories and tell them what I heard there you go but that's true and I'm like I love that because it boils it down to like what you do you know I do I listen to people's stories um but you do it in a in a controlled environment you mm. know um in a safe place for them you know, and I think that's, um, that's a big difference. So, um, yeah. teaching them how to do that in a, in a safe place where they can stay regulated, um, and not, um, become overwhelmed. Right. Right. Exactly. I think that's a really important aspect of it. So, um, so I know we met a long time ago when both of us were still uh, relatively new to the anti-trafficking movement. I was still um, volunteering um, at um, the first organization I worked for. You were working with um, a relatively new organization as well. Um, so what led you into working with victims of trauma? So, you know, back in the olden days, when, when I lived in, in Houston, um, I, I mean, I've lived there like a million times, right? Like most of my yeah. life, but, um, it was very, um, I would call it more renegade style than anything else. And I feel like that was like the oh, beginning yeah. of the trafficking, anti-trafficking movement in Houston yeah. was just like, we were, here, very we were here for the wild, wild west. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you, as you well know, that is not yeah. a sustainable way to live. So, nope. Nope. um, and in August of 2016, I was completely burned out. Like after working, um, in even just for two years, I was like, well, we're done here. <laughs> God's yeah. like, uh, move along. Like this is like, yeah, time out, you know? Um, so I did, I took, uh, just over two years off. Um, mm -hmm. we moved up by Fort Worth. And so like there, a lot of changes were happening anyway when I started to get settled again and start feeling like I really want to get back into this work, I went to go see my friend, Emily Mills at Jesus said love. And, and I was like, Hey, I really want to get back into work, this kind of work. Do you have any suggestions or connections or anything? And she was like, you mm -hmm. know, she paused for a minute and this is like the most poignant part of my life. She paused <laughs> for a moment and she was like, you know, people who have longevity in this type of work have to know their stories really well. And I was like, okay. Um, I know my story really well. Like, yeah. What do you mean? Like, what do you th tell me more? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> what, is, what are you talking about? Um, so she, she was like, I, she's like, read this book. And you know, 
just tell me what you think. And so the book that she rec- recommended was To Be Told by Dan Allender. And I read that. I and like, love Dan Allender. I love him. Uh, read it in 24 hours. Was just mm-hmm. floored by the way this older gentleman just yes. came across as so vulnerable and so open. I was like, oh, dear God. Like, I don't know that people like this exist, but also your vulnerabilities make me feel vulnerable. And so, uh, yes. yeah, I started doing story work like instantly. I was like, all right, let's mm-hmm. do this. Let's unpack this. Let's land this plane. You know, um, I started, I mean, immediately. And then shortly thereafter, I was teaching a group at my church because that's something I did back then. And then yeah. um, led several groups through story work with that over three semesters, started my coaching practice. And then 2020 hit and I was like, hmm. <sighs> What are we going to do here? Yeah. Yeah. Feels like five years. Um, (laughs) The longest year on record. You're not kidding. I think it was a leap year that year. (laughs) Right. Freaking long as hell. It was horrible. (laughs) But I, what, what started this is like, okay, I was like, I'm going to create something. And I ended up like creating some classes and putting those online. And they were just like, and then my grandmother passed away in June of 2020. And, um, she had been fighting dementia for eight years and finally, you know, Mm -hmm. lost her battle with that. And that was one of those life changing moments for me because she was my mother, um, for all Mm -hmm. intents and purposes. Uh, and even though she hadn't been like active in my life for those years that she had dementia, um, Mm -hmm. she still always knew who I was. Like, even when she couldn't speak, I could tell in her eyes that like, you know, I was her lovey. And so like she, you know, that was always very special to me. And it was, you know, a devastating loss where you're just like, well, I'm just going to quit everything and question everything about my life. So did that. And then a few months later, you know, I start working in my garden because she always kept a a really great garden. Both her, both my grandparents were amazing gardeners and I was like farming. And I mean, we own two acres just outside of DFW Mm -hmm. and, um, like got the, you know, farm animals and sorry to say, we even slaughtered our own chickens. Just they were delicious. <laughs> just so you know, even if you're a vegan, it's fine. Um, but <laughs> I was like, okay, so what am I going to do? Like, am I just going to be a farmer now? This is just who I am. Yeah. In this the meantime, <laughs> yeah, this is my life. Um, in the meantime, I had applied for the certificate program at the Allender Center. And I was like, mm-hmm. and they mm-hmm. called me and said, hey, we want to do an interview because we have classes coming up and we're going to do them all online. I'm like, okay, but this is probably not my life's work anymore, but it's fine. Whatever, I'll do it. And they're, they email me back and they tell me who that who I'm going to be interviewing with. And it's one of the founding members of the Allender Center who I loved. And I was like a little starstruck to talk to is this woman talking to me right now um told her my story told her you know what was going on in my life and everything so incredibly genuine and amazing and she was like Wendy I really feel like you would be really great at this work I feel like you already are but this would just like take you to that next step yeah. Like whatever you say, like I won't just me. Um, <laughs> the Allender Center is wonderful. Uh, just uh, you've never met people like that, like ever. Mm-hmm. Like I understand why it becomes one of those things that people just go back to and go back to and back to because there's no yes. other people on the world, not that I've met at least, that are just so genuine and kind and just like they're not nice people. You know what I mean? Like nice is like, oh, yeah. hi, how are you? You know. They're very kind yeah. of like, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to sit here with you and, and virtually hold your hand you. while we do it. Yes. yes, exactly. Um, so I ended up getting accepted into that. And I was like, all right, Lord, this is just what we're doing. I'm farming and we're doing story work. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and after the second session with them, I was like, hmm, well, here's a thought. What if like gardening and farming and story work were all one thing? And I made the crazy decision to start a nonprofit around that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is a crazy decision, isn't it? It, it really is. The paperwork alone. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. So I've yeah, helped people so form their nonprofits. It's, it's, it's it, delightful. 
I was like, I mean, I don't know how many times a year I must question my decision in life, but here we are. And I love it. And I, I wouldn't do it differently. I just, you know, it's just one of those things where you love it so much and then you're like, what did I do? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I created this thing, but, um, but yeah, that's how, that's how Grip Plus Gumption was, was birthed. My third oh, child. There you go. I love it. So you're like a storytelling farmer. <laughs> storytelling <laughs> farmer i'm a really bad farmer right now because we haven't had rain in forever it's been 114 oh my gosh. nothing lives nothing lives I here i understand we had this freak storm last night and i was like rain is that water rain? from the sky I know. <laughs> but it's you know no it's back to being uh, oh, 97 right now oh, so wow, that's like a cool front that's beautiful that, practically it's under yeah it's under 100 so you know the joys of living in texas <laughs> yeah but anyway so um so you doing story work you're farming um you are working with domestic violence um survivors and um trafficking survivors and um, what else is going on i know you wrote a book i did the, another one of those projects that I was like, what did I do? Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I understand. I'm in, I'm, I'm in the middle of my second one right now. Oh, gosh. Oh. So, so yeah. Um, hmm. How to describe that. So I, I've always wanted to write a book. I've always, mm -hmm. I've been writing since I was probably my daughter's age. She's 10. I used to write short stories and I was like, there's no way I have anything that I could write a book about. And then bam, <laughs> life happens. So yes. I'm like, and as I'm writing this book, like more life is happening. And I'm just like, well, here's a second book that I'm going to be able to write out one day. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's called Quelling the Tempest, Discovering the Warrior Within the Sexual Abuse Survivor. And it uh, talks about my very first experience with rape mm -hmm. and, uh, how I, it, it parallels like my healing journey as well. So I share stories about, um, some of the things that I, I went through a lot of my trauma and all the things that I've survived through. And then just also paralleling with like, this is, this has happened. And also it, like, you're not alone. You know, mm -hmm. I, I want people to be able to see themselves in my book and, yes. and, and feel seen just through reading my story. Yeah. Um, and then I talk a lot about my healing journey and story work and the importance of story. Um, obviously story is like one of my passions. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've, I mean, I've heard it taught that there are four different stories that we carry with us, right? There's the story mm -hmm. we tell ourselves, the story we tell others, um, the stories that others tell about us. And then there's the truth. And unfortunately, mm. these four stories are very different from each other. And the work That's of so healing and story work is to uncover the truth of the story that you're carrying inside your body, right? And trauma stays stored in your body. And without the truth yes. of your story, you won't be able to process that trauma or that story and grow and heal in the way that you need to. I so, love that. That's so interesting. Yeah. I um, Through this process as well as just doing story work over the last five years, I've been able to uncover a lot of truths about myself that I didn't realize, mm -hmm. oh, this is what I thought this was or what I'd been told that this is it doesn't mirror what mm -hmm. is actually true. And I think mm -hmm. as we dig deeper down into parts of our stories, we start uncovering those things. I heard this yeah. podcast one time and it was with Jewel, the singer songwriter. And mm -hmm. she talked about how she realized she wasn't broken. She was just buried. And mm. I was like, put that on a t-shirt, you know, like right? just uncovering That's and awesome. uncovering, covering until you find like your truest self down. Yeah. Like, underneath the, all of the yeah. stuff. Underneath all the junk. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. I love it. So it's a very personal book. Yes. Um, <laughs> My, I was meeting with my editor what? last week and, um, yeah. and she, you know, um, I started crying <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is not about you. And actually it's not even about the story. I'm just realizing that I have a problem with perfection. 
Oh, and yes. Perfectionism. So it's just something else to talk about in therapy this week. <laughs> <laughs> it, that, that, that's a hard one because perfectionism is so, can be so paralyzing. Um, it's generational. It really, yes. It's like one of those generational curses, generational traumas people talk about because like it's. Yes. It's, it's down in there. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. And it can stop you from moving forward because you just want to keep fixing and keep fixing and keep fixing yes. and keep fixing until you feel like it's perfect, but it can never be perfect. It can never be perfect. Because nope. I just, I firmly believe that there is just no such thing as perfect. There's not, I mean, I tell my daughter and, that all the time, but like, yeah, you know, but of course, believing it yourself is a whole, you know. <laughs> Those who can't do teach, there's a reason. Right, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't even remember what it was I saw about that. Or like, people, uh, I think it was a LinkedIn post about like, so who, who, how many of us know all of the answers? Like, we know all the answers. But then how many of us are doing all of the things that we know the answers for? It's like, mm. oh, guilty. Guilty. Okay. Like, I can okay. tell people all day long, like, what the right thing to do. Um, and how to how to regulate and how to you know go through these trauma informed steps and how to do you know but um, how often do I follow my own advice? Not oh yeah, yeah. Really as often like, as I should. I feel like people are brought into relationship with you. Some <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> <coughs> choked on my own spit. <laughs> <Desiree>. <laughs> like I'm failing as a human when I do stuff like that. I'm like, this is a brainstem function. How am I doing this wrong? <laughs> it's like choke on that little bit of spit. Like it felt yes. like a hairball. Just what? Yes. What is wrong? It's like when you're standing straight up and then you just fall. Like what is yes. what's even moving? Okay. Um, what was I saying? No, I can't remember. <laughs> we were about um oh good lord so um, you don't know either no. i know we got derailed we're, oh we're talking about um following our own advice mm, okay i believe that people are put into your life in relationships to be a mirror sometimes now some mm -hmm. people yes. they just suck right they come into your life yes. and you're like well you suck as a person see you later right. but like other people I, I, I heard this one time on a video and I was like, Ooh, that cuts deep. And it was like, uh, mm -hmm. if you basically, if you caught it, you got it. You know, like if, if you're like, Oh, she irritates me cause she's always so dramatic or, you know, whatever. And you're mm -hmm. like, Oh, well, that's me. I'm definitely like yeah. way too dramatic about something. <laughs> uh, so like good, good relationships, you know, come into your life and you're like, you know, why doesn't she just like, do some yoga or something like meditator. And you're like, Oh yeah, I could do that. I <laughs> do some meditating or yoga. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I totally agree. It is. It's those relationships that, um, it is. It's those mirrors that we like, we get, we get sideways with and we're like, why are they doing that? And it's like, mm -hmm. it's what irritates the, me about other people that I realize it's what really is irritating me about me. Yes. I'm like, yes. oh, it irrita that irritates <sighs> that, that, that what they're doing that's irritating me is a habit I have in myself yes. that I hate. I find that <laughs> in my husband. I'm like, you're driving me crazy. And I'm like, damn it. He could say the same thing about me. I hope he mm -hmm. doesn't. If he knows what's good for him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like, no, don't point it out at me. I only get to point it out at you. Uh, when he has a comment, his our daughter is like his, sometimes his mini me. I mean, she looks just like mm -hmm. him, but usually what comes out of her mouth is me. But every once in a while, they'll get into I a fight that. and they'll go back and forth. And I'm like, sucks trying to argue with her, doesn't it? It's really annoying. Remind you of anybody? <laughs> <laughs> it's like having a conversation with yourself, isn't it? No right? winning. <laughs> no winning. Yeah. Can't argue with yourself. Especially miniature versions of yourself. Mm-hmm. It's super annoying. Yeah. Oh, so being in the anti-trafficking space still today, um, we're among uh, a not very many who have lasted a really long time in it. Um, and there's a lot of uh, noise going around it uh, right now, you know, with um, 
the movie The Sound of Freedom that has just mm-hmm. come out recently. Um, I myself um, have made the choice not to see it. Um, I've um, worked in with tra- directly with, with survivors of trafficking for going on 15 years. Um, mm-hmm. And I have seen movies like this in the past. Sure. And what I hate to call out <laughs> other organizations and things like that. It's just what bothers me about movies like this is that it makes people believe a certain narrative mm. about what trafficking looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it brings people a very dramatic um, picture and takes focus away from how trafficking looks um Mm -hmm. on a much broader scale right um so i feel like it you know i i can't tell you how many times and i'm sure you've experienced this too when i was speaking about trafficking awareness and things like that to large groups um and questions are asked more about kidnapping and um cages and chains and and um rescue operations and things like that than about real things like um, grooming over, you know, um, rope and things that, yeah, things like that, coercion by, um, you know, boyfriends or friends at school and things like that. Um, And so this is something I've seen a lot of conversation amongst survivors um, that I know. And, and, um, so it's kind of been a big push pull in in the anti trafficking movement right now. So, you know, what are your thoughts? I'm just like in the work that I do about uncovering false narratives. You know, I'm passionate about mm-hmm. uncovering these false narratives in the public yeah. as well. And the biggest one, I think, like you said, that we're we're dealing with right now. We've had these movies come and go, right? But it's the false narrative around sex trafficking. And that's thanks in large part to cult groups like QAnon and their following. Um, And then, you know, public people like Tim Ballard and Jim Caviezel and this movie Sound of Freedom, people have a very skewed view of human trafficking, Mm -hmm. what what sex trafficking more specifically looks like. And when you have two people who have microphones screaming really loud about what they believe sex trafficking is, people um, think we have to listen to them and worse off, believe them. And I hate to break it to you, but not every white man with a microphone is right and or smart, you know? <laughs> um, and it Very creates, it, it's created this war between actual survivors of human trafficking and the popular opinion of some dudes that got together, raised a crap ton of money and made a movie. Um, yeah. Instead of going, um, instead of going to the real heroes, the survivors of trafficking themselves, they put this whole belief system into a group that yes, made them $56 million in 2020, but they didn't do squat for those survivors that they supposedly rescued. Yeah. Um, And it's frustrating because I know I've been um, interviewed and been part of um, documentaries that were survivor led um, that couldn't get funded mm -hmm. um, so that they could be released on a wider scale. Um, And so, and these were good projects that were mm-hmm. were driven by actual survivors of trafficking um, domestically and that told real stories of how these things happened here in the United States, uh, stories of coercion and, and um, you know, uh, of, of how people got sucked into this life and the systems that, that abused them and the, you know, that weren't glorified, that weren't, you know, um, all about a rescuer that came in or anything like that. And, um, and they didn't have the funding to get it all the way produced, you know, and made into a full length movie so that it could, could be released widely. And that's very Mm -hmm. frustrating. Well, and I think we, we've all seen those, right. And, and here's, Mm -hmm. here's the problem. Um, or here, here's the thing we're dealing with right now. Um, a popular word that I've been seeing more recently because of, a song that's come out is a, a dog whistle, right? And I had to look it up like specifically because I wanted to get it like 100% accurate. And it, mm-hmm. it's it's a dog whistle as a subtly aimed political message, which is intended for and can only be understood by a particular group. Okay. Um, 
when there are people out there spreading misinformation and or disinformation, they are keen to add in these dog whistles that only a certain group of people understand. Okay. So if I'm making a false video about human trafficking and I want to get it to the QAnon crowd, okay, I'm going to mention statistics like 800,000 children are trafficked in the U.S. every year. Not a, mm -hmm. not a good statistic at all. Not anywhere near true. I'm going to mention Disney. I'm going to mention OUR. I'm going to mention um, Jim Caviezel or, you know, maybe a political fi figure. So many of these little semen seemingly innocuous words go together to reinforce this web of lies that people believe. Um, and because social media creates echo chambers with their algorithms, they will just keep being fed these same lies and believing the whole world believes what they believe. And that is dangerous to say the least. Yeah, I, I would, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, when, uh, when the same people are speaking over and over again, and that's all you see, um, it does become very dangerous um, because we're, you know, we're being, like you said, it's an echo chamber when those same mm -hmm. things keep getting recycled um, over and over and over again. And, um, and people do, they follow people who are like-minded, you know, and they um, fill their, fill social media with people who are like-minded, you sure. know, um, which is, um, is not in and of itself, you know, a bad thing. It's social media. It's, it's, you're, you're connecting with friends. You're connecting with people you like, you're connecting, you're following things that are of your interest, but, um, it does then create a, um, a situation where you're only hearing one point of view. If you take everything that we just talked about and then integrate that with the issue of trafficking, which is so huge, and people only believe this one narrative about trafficking, we're ultimately just creating like a shit storm around healing that yeah. says, we don't believe you and your story is not true. Yeah. And that is toxic and completely unnecessary and hinders growth and healing for the victims that had a typical tra trafficking experience. I hate to use that, but like, like yeah. in the United States, but it doesn't match the one that's big and flashy on the screen. So not yeah. only are people's stories not believed, they're being told that they're liars or worse, they're being called traffickers themselves for speaking out against movies like this. Yeah. You know, I would equate it to something like, um, uh, the issue of, of date rape, right. And like the late nineties, early two thousands, that word was becoming more prevalent, but we saw a lot of blip victim blaming and victim shaming around that. We saw yes. that word in the context of like, just like it was just date rape, you know, um, it was downplayed. Many victims still don't know to this day what happened to them, which was rape, mm -hmm. plain and simple. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that in the trafficking space as well. It's hard. It's harmful. It's exploitive yeah. and, yes. and it's harmful. Yeah. I would definitely agree with that. I would definitely agree with that. So I'm really glad that there's people like you that are helping women tell their stories um, in a real and um, honest way um, and helping them to see that their stories are valid um, and that their story does matter, um, mm -hmm. even in the face of um, very popular <laughs> and very um, public, you know, Mainstream, yeah. narratives that are, that are, um, so completely different than, than what they've experienced. Um, and allowing them to get to the root, you know, allowing them to get to the root of, of their true story. Um, and it doesn't have to match what's on the screen, you know, because the vast majority of people, it's not going to. No. And they're not seeing themselves reflected at all. And I think, you no. know, the pushback on it is like, this is not a typical experience but it's, it seems to be thought that like, we're saying that child trafficking does not exist. Nobody's saying that. It's not, Nobody's saying that at all. Not at all. But I've a 17 year old, <laughs> yeah. A 17 year old's a child in the eyes mm -hmm. of the law. Uh, so is a nine year old, a 10 year old, a 13 year old, a 14 year old. Um, yeah. There are trans youth that are trafficked, you know, LGBTQ plus community. Yeah trafficked, marginalized communities. But those are not, those are not the trafficking victims that people want to support. No. Right. So yeah. 
again, these, these dog whistles of like, this is what we want you to think it looks like. And we'll gladly take all of your money to portray this. But yeah. if they actually knew what trafficking looked like and what the victims look like, they wouldn't want to have anything to do with it. So yeah. it's more of a, look at me, I support this, you know, um, yeah. facade, but they don't want to really know. Yeah. And I think that's always been the hard part. Um, the attention, you know, even in news media and things like that um, is very different when it's a, um, you know, uh, wealthy family, when it's a, um, you know, Caucasian girl, when it's a, you know, something like the, something like that, rather than when it's, um, you know, a, a black girl from, you know, mm -hmm. inner city Houston or something like that. So the coverage that it gets is very different. Very um, different. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that it just, this is the, the movie is just kind of further highlighting that disparity um, as well. So. Which is ironic because and you can cut this out if it's too far, but um, <laughs> you have a white dude uh, carrying out black and brown bodies and that's fine. But like, what do you do with those black and brown bodies afterwards? Well, yeah. according to reports, you just send them back home and traumatize them for the day. And that's totally fine. But the whole white savior complex like comes into play like yes. right here. And that is yes. just like people that that eat up that narrative that just like makes their bellies all full and fat. They just love that. And the rest of us are like over here. Uh, no, yeah. don't do that. Yeah. That's let's not do that. It's not OK. Yeah. Not how it works. You're exploiting people. Don't do that. Yes. Yes. I was just talking with an organization that, um, that I'm doing some consulting for right now. And um, they do uh, some street outreach. And there's another organization, a faith-based organization that does street outreach as well, where they are, that does like a prophetic prayer and stuff while they're down there. Um, and I have nothing against faith-based ministries. Um, but they go down there and um, they do their um, you know, prophecy and, and all this stuff down there. And then the group actually asked one of the women working on the street to take their picture, their group's oh, picture. Oh dear God. Um, when I, they were getting ready to leave, like I I'm, asked them to take a group picture. No, you know, <laughs> I was like, you I, know, I can't. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> said to feed the hungry. Not and take care of the widow and orphan. Ask how um, you do your good deed. Even, you know, I'm really against like people, like as an organization, we never post pictures of our clients. If you see pictures no. of people, they're stock images because you're not seeing who yes. we're working with. Like if no, they want to post on not. their social media that like they went on one of our treats, cool. Uh, more power to you. But we are absolutely not big N.O going to re-exploit you in the process to bring in those donor dollars. No, like I'll be yeah. broken poor. It's fine. I don't want to re-exploit people. I feel like I'm going to like that. That's a ticket to hell for me. <laughs> that's a no, it's a hard pass. So I'm, I'm very leery about, I mean, I, I say this like with, with two hands of like, we, are technically according to the IRS a religious organization because we have decided that if if open we would like to pray with our clients so there's that yeah but like looking at faith-based organization I'm always very leery of like mm, okay but like which side of the coin are you on you know because that again is yeah. a very di diverse group of, of people and you could be getting mm -hmm. you know prophetic people who want a woman who's being trafficked to uh, take their picture on the corner after they call out her Jezebel spirit or, you know, whatever uh, kind exactly. of garbage they're going to put out there Exactly. Uh, versus going down there and being like, Hey, do you have any condoms today? Let me give you some condoms. Yes. Are you thirsty? Do you want some water? It's hot out. Do you want to sit yes. here for a while? Those high, those heels are high. Like, sit, do, do you, you need, yes. Yeah. Do you need, it's yeah. not like I'm here to help. I'm here. I'm here to rescue you like that. Yeah. 
That's to a, save your soul. <laughs> talk, talk about a dog whistle there. Hello, the word yes. rescue, like right away. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Like, no, like let's pause right no. there. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I work yeah. with a, a survivor. I actually, I met her mom uh, at, at a, an event um, while her, while she was being trafficked prayed for this girl for years, like just knew about her, knew her mom, knew her family. Mm-hmm. And then, um, she, she got out and she contacted me a few months later to be like, Hey, thanks for, you know, being there for my mom and everything. We became good friends. We talked like every day for a year. She helped me in the beginning, um, start uh, grit plus gumption. Anyway, she does street outreach right there on Bissonette. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, she'll go down there, all different kinds of, sna- like they've got all different kinds of snack setups and like, yeah you know, every, but like also all the things that like, she wished people had brought her when she was walking the track, you know, like, like girl products and this and condoms and like all these, like her and her mom made handmade masks in the beginning of the pandemic. Cause she was like, these girls are out here. They don't have any masks. It's not like you can go to the store Mm -hmm. and buy any. Cause that was a huge thing. And they hand sewed a bunch of masks to give out and gave them gloves. Yeah. You know, sometimes, that's, I mean, you, sometimes yeah, that's enough. We, yeah, we need to bring them with their, when I ran outreach, I mean, we took them in the summer, you know, bug spray. I mean, cold water. Yeah. Um, you know, some food that they could carry with them um, so that we wouldn't get them in trouble, you know, for, for yeah. um, loitering around us um, instead of, instead of, you know, keep them moving with what they needed to do. You know, we made every effort not to um, impede their work and get them in trouble. You know, our, we didn't, we didn't ever try to put up any barriers that would, that might get them um, seen by their trafficker and, and, you know, put into some kind of danger. So um, yeah, her and her mom made, to know um, what you're doing. I mean, made huge connections with, with the the girls yeah. and the pimps like they they all knew yes. oh they're down here you know every other saturday or whatever and and yeah that's how like just the relationship building part i think was the most important and integral part of it is. and you know yeah. like of her work and there were times when you know girls like could could trust her and be like hey i need to leave today and she would you know help them find a place and get them out of there and and whatever she needed to do, but it wasn't her ultimate, her, it wasn't her agenda. If yes. that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. That wasn't why they were down there. Yeah. But it was available if needed. So, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate you being on the show today. I've had such a great time catching up and talking about all the things you're doing and, um, you know, even getting serious for a little bit and talking about what's, you know, what's going on in the trafficking movement today. So, um, how can people find out more information about you or grit plus gumption, um, donate if they want to all that kind of good stuff. So how can they, how can they do all that good stuff? Yeah. So we are during the month of July, we're doing a campaign called evolve, which was, uh, talking about all the issues that happened in childhood and how they affect you later in life and, and fundraising for our fall retreats and, um, our, our three new clients that we took on this summer. Um, so you can go to grit plus um, all one word. And then, uh, there's a donate page. There's a more learn more about us page. Um, there's a sign up for our email list page. We're also on like all the social medias at, at grit plus gumption. Um, G R I T P L U S G U M P T I O N. No worries. I'll put <laughs> I don't it in the notes. I think I've ever spelled that out loud that way before. Don't worry. I'll, I'll put it in the notes of the podcast so people Perfect. can reach and it. And then um, you can. Fo- <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm also on social media. Same thing. Um, it's at Mrs. Wendy J. Olson, M R S W E N D Y J O L S O N, not E N. Um, so yeah, I make videos and talk about trafficking and exploitation and, and trauma. It's my favorite thing to talk about is trauma. No, oh, no. So it's so weird. Isn't it? there's... <laughs> <laughs> my job I is weird. I know. Oh, I know. I understand. 
understand. But thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, I've enjoyed talking to you. And um, yeah, so this is um, Desiree Parker. And um, thank you for listening to Empower Together today. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.